Hello everyone, in this presentation we will talk about scientific workflows and reproducibility in ecological niche modeling. My name is Luis Gadelha. I work at the National Laboratory for Scientific Computing in Brazil. I'm currently on leave to work at the uh, Balance of the Microverse Cluster of Excellence in the University of Vienna in Germany. Uh, this presentation will also be given by Maria Luisa Mondelli. She's a doctoral student at the National Laboratory for Scientific Computing. This is the agenda for our presentation. Uh, first, we will introduce uh, some concepts from data intensive science and computational scientific experiments. Uh, next, uh, we talk about scientific workflows. Uh, defining them and showing how they have been used so far in ecological niche modeling. Next, uh, we uh, describe reproducibility in ecological niche modeling, uh, showing uh, the challenge and also uh, ongoing research in this area. And finally, we close the, the, the presentation with some concluding remarks. Uh, data intensive science is defined by the exploration of large scale data sets to produce scientific results. Uh, it is enabled by the large scale computational infrastructures uh, now available and also by the increasing volumes of data produced by high capacity scientific instruments and also by initiatives to uh, produce and gather data such as the di digitization of uh, biological collections. Uh, data intensive science involves various research objects such as data sets, including reference data sets, curated databases, scientific software, scientific workflows, experimental protocols, uh, and also uh, the resulting publications. Uh, from uh, this computational research. Ideally, all the research objects should follow the FAIR principles. This means that uh, it should be easy to discover them independently uh, by humans and machines. Uh, it should be easy to recover them under well-defined conditions. Uh, it should be easy to integrate them with other research objects, especially uh, when uh, metadata standards are used, for instance. And finally, it should be uh, easy to use these research uh, objects in experiment re-executions, along with other research objects. Um, Data-intensive science also relies on computational scientific experiments. These can be defined as the by, can be defined by the composition of various computational activities, such as programs and calls uh, for function libraries, for instance. Uh, uh, these these uh, computational scientific experiments have some frequent features, such as the multitude of computational activities, uh, the management of large scale amounts of data, and the use of parallel and distributed computing. Scientific workflows uh, can be seen as a concrete example of computational scientific experiments. Uh, they consist of the specification of a chain of scientific applications uh, that need to be executed, and also of the mutual dependencies that exist between these scientific applications. Uh, scientific workflows uh, follow a life cycle that is similar to that, to that of the computational scientific experiments. Uh, so we have a, a step of composition where the, uh, the scientific applications that compose the scientific workflow will be uh, defined uh, along with uh, the dependencies that exist between uh, 
these scientific applications. Uh, in, an, in a subsequent step, uh, the scientific workflow needs to be executed. So every scientific application needs to be mapped to some computational resource where it will be executed. And also the data sets that will be consumed by each scientific application need to be transferred to this computational resource. And finally, there is a step of uh, documentation where metadata and provenance are collected. Uh, and these consist of, of events that happen during the execution of the workflow, for instance. And a scientific workflow management system is a system that allows for managing the life cycle of scientific workflows. So it, it supports uh, the composition, execution, and documentation of uh, scientific workflows. So one of the main objectives of scientific workflow management systems is the automation of computational scientific experiments. Uh, so uh, some features that are uh, commonly, commonly found in scientific workflow management systems include uh, scheduling tasks based on data dependencies, uh, data flow between these tasks, uh, identifying parallel uh, and identifying independent tasks and executing them in parallel, um, scheduling tasks in high performance computing environments or cloud uh, computing environments, uh, managing and querying data provenance uh, that uh, describe uh, the execution of the scientific workflow. Some examples of scientific workflow management systems include uh, Kepler. Kepler has a graphical user interface for defining and composing the workflow. Uh, it is often used for executing bioinformat bioinformatics workflows, and it has a good integration with the R scripting language. Swift is a scientific workflow management system focused on high-performance computing. It has a functional programming language for uh, specifying the workflow, and it has uh, features for automated and implicit parallelism Vistrails is another scientific workflow management system that also has a graphical user interface. It's uh, often used for scientific visualization applications, and it has good um, support for recording provenance. More recently, uh, there is a trend of incorporating uh, workflow management techniques uh, to Python and R. Since these are uh, scripting language uh, often used by uh, computational scientists and, and it's common that um, many of these scientists don't want to uh, dedicate their time to learn uh, a new language or a new system uh, uh, specialized only in spe specifying the workflow. So some, some libraries uh, were implemented for Python and R to bring the functionality of workflow management uh, to these languages. So we have some examples here. Uh, no workflow is a library for Python that allows for capturing uh, and analyzing provenance. Our data tracker is also a provenance management implementation, but in this case for the R scripting language. Parso is a library uh, for Python that allows for the specification uh, and composition of the scientific workflows, and it has support for uh, automated parallelism uh, uh, during the execution of these workflows. 
next we will explore uh, how uh, these scientific workflows have been used for ecological niche modeling. One first example uh, is a work from Pennington and colleagues from 2007. Uh, they used the Kepler workflow management system to implement uh, an ecological niche modeling workflow. Uh, this allowed for uh, easy management of the structural aspects of uh, the ecological niche modeling workflow, allowing, for instance, uh, for application uh, components to be easily replaced. Uh, they implemented also a library of application components uh, for ecological niche modeling, including data transformation and pre-processing, geospatial processing, and semantic annotation of processes. Uh, they did a, a case a study uh, with occurrence data from the MAMO networked information system and future climatological scenarios from IPCC to predict the impact of climate change on more than 2,000 species. The software uh, for assisted habitat modeling is another example of a scientific workflow for ecological niche modeling. Uh, it also has implemented uh, a library of uh, computational activities uh, regarding ecological niche modeling, for instance, for pre and post processing. Uh, the implementation uh, was performed uh, in the Vistrails workflow management system, uh, which uh, has benefited um, the ecological niche modeling application uh, since it supports provenance management and uh, keeping track of the events that happen during the execution of, of ecological niche modeling workflows. Uh, more recently, in 2016, uh, a work uh, was published uh, describing BioVail. BioVail is the Biodiversity Virtual e-Laboratory. Uh, and it's a, a web application that uh, implemented a number of uh, workflows and computational activities for biodiversity in general, and uh, many of them uh, for ecological niche modeling specifically. Um, so some examples of, of predefined activities that are available and, and in this web interface include the geographic and temporal selection of occurrences, data cleaning, uh, taxonomic name resolution. Uh, there are a number of ecological niche modeling algorithms available and also computational activities from other aspects of, of biodiversity, uh, for instance, metagenomics and phylogenetics uh, applications. And all of these applications components uh, can be composed uh, freely into uh, various uh, scientific workflows for analyzing biodiversity. Um, also, we have many examples of ecological niche modeling tools that were implemented in script, scripting languages such as R and Python, and at the same time uh, supporting uh, workflow management techniques. So, for instance, uh, all of these examples here uh, target the reproducibility, uh, such as SDM, Model R, Wallace, Zoom R, and KUENN, uh, and also uh, for instance, Model R uh, has also support for the parallel execution of ecological uh, niche modeling. So this was a brief overview of, of scientific workflows uh, and how they have been used in ecological niche modeling. 
Uh, next, uh, Maria Luisa will explore uh, the topic of reproducibility. Hello, everyone. Professor Luis uh, mentioned aspects of computational experiments and how defining them using scientific workflow concepts and technologies can be useful. These technologies are important uh, not only in terms of organizing or automating the analysis or experiment, but also for enabling and improving reproducibility. So I would like to take the opportunity to comment uh, on some aspects of reproducibility, complementing a little bit what was presented in week number 31. So in week number 31, we had uh, some presentations on the challenges of reproducibility in ecological niche modeling. And I brought uh, here some points to remember what those challenges are. So considering the scenario in which we have a paper written by someone, when reading this paper, we usually look for details to understand the methodology under which conditions uh, and data and analysis, for example, was performed. And if we intend to reproduce what has been done, we need the details to be sufficient for us to be able to recover the data, parameters, settings, and so on. However, uh, this information is not always easily accessible or reported in some way in papers. This, uh, this happens in, in the most diverse areas. It's not a specific problem of ecological niche modeling. In fact, uh, recent studies have indicated the existence of a reproducibility crisis in scientific research. And because of that, uh, we need to adopt good practices for reproducibility and formalize how to report uh, results. That said, uh, what uh, reproducibility really means? Well, reproducibility is related to the idea that a method should produce consistent results when performed more than once. And because of that, uh, results can be validated and verified. Reproducibility also allows others to reuse and extend experiments. And this can increase research impact, quality, and visibility. In addition, there is no consensus on the exact definition of the term reproducibility, but we understand that there is a small difference uh, between the terms reproducibility and replicability. So we choose to use the following definition. Replicability is doing the exact same experiment again, and reproducibility allows variations on the original experiment or data analysis. And because reproducibility allows for variations, we can have different reproducibility levels, especially since most of the time, not all the artifacts can be uh, made available, uh, the artifacts that uh, were used in the experiment. But even so, we can allow a certain level of reproduction. And by artifact, I mean the components that of are part of the data analysis process or the experiments such as data, algorithms, uh, code, for example. In this paper by Juliana Freire, uh, we have the definition of some levels. For example, the repeatable level is more related to the idea of replicability that I mentioned before, and needs that all artifacts have no changes and are available for reproduction to be done at that the rerunnable level tells us the results of an experiment remain consistent even with variations in the input data or the parameter settings used. This is useful, for example, when we cannot make the data available for some reason, but yet we can make other artifacts available so others can still explore what we have done. And we have another uh, other level. For example, portable, extendable, and modified. Some studies uh, indicate good practices for reproducibility. I brought here two references and outlined some of these practices. You may consider these as the main practices. And considering that each area has its specificities and there is still no exact consensus on how to report or conduct reproducible research, there is no recipe or rule that generalizes on which tools or guidelines uh, to follow. 
This may also depend on the journal you will submit your paper. For example, um, some journals have specific guidelines for reproducibility and data availability. In any case, uh, following these good practices can be useful not only for people who will try to reproduce your work, but also for your own productivity. And why is that? Well, for works that are based on previous analysis or evolve from those analyses, we often uh, need to go back to steps already implemented. And these practices help us to stay more organized and remember details that are not always so trivial to remember. So here um, are some practices, for example, code and data versioning. Um, it is a, a good tool for this. Use, the, uh, use of standardized data formats, use of free and open tools, testing, data sharing uh, through platforms like Figshare, Gaiad, automation uh, through the use of scientific workflow technologies or scripting languages such as Python and R, and also detailed process documentation such as recording provenance data, metadata, and checklists, the use of checklists. Speaking a little bit more about the tools specific to ecological niche modeling, I brought here two examples um, that Professor Luis already mentioned. Uh, they were built to support reproducibility. Um, for example, we have BioVal. Uh, it offers a web-based environment for managing scientific workflows for biodiversity, and it has various predefined activities um, available in its like geographic and temporal selection of occurrences, data cleaning, ecological niche modeling algorithms, and others. Zoom R um, is a modeler framework for constructing reproducible FDM workflows for R. Uh, the results can be published through a data repository so that others can access it, access it. and it can be loaded back into the R environment together with the package allowing reproducibility of the analysis. And here uh, we have uh, also three other examples of uh, general purpose tools. Hotel um, is a platform for creating, publishing, and executing research objects. It has components for data collection, identity management, data publication, and interfaces with analy analytical tools uh, to ma manipulate data. It also uses Docker to preserve the computational environment used. Uh, another tool is uh, ReproZip, uh, is an open source tool to pack your research along with all necessary data files, libraries, environment uh, variables, and other options. So anyone who wants to reproduce does not need to install the tools and dependencies um, manually. And we also have Drake. Uh, it's a um, R package that analyzes the workflow and skips skip steps uh, with up-to-date results, avoiding unnecessary re-execution. It also has functionalities uh, for reproducibility. And here uh, in this link, um, it has uh, a list of several other useful tools for reproducibility, and it may be helpful for you if you are looking for any specific functionality. So you can, uh, you can find more other tools uh, in this link. Now, thinking about uh, how to allow a complete reproduction of a workflow, we thought uh, of a framework in this paper we published last year, where the idea is somehow packaging the workflow and its dependencies, allowing it to be encapsulated. Uh, we do not propose um, a, need, a new tool, uh, but instead, we propose the steps that can benefit from existing tools to support reproducibility. So considering this scenario in which we have an analysis implemented uh, using a scripting language, which consumes and produces data, the idea is to first 
encapsulate uh, this. Here I use model R, uh, which is an R package for ecological niche modeling. By detecting its dependencies and placing it on a virtual machine, then um, a validation step, uh, we have a validation step for executing and collecting the provenance data of this analysis within this virtual machine. And finally, a step for publication um, of the experiment and its provenance data on a platform that allows uh, these experiments to be easily referenced and accessible, following uh, the, the, the FAIR principle that we, we already mentioned in this presentation. So by following these steps, the user should be able to share and reuse the experiment. And publication contains information that meets even minimally the, the FAIR print. In week number uh, 31, uh, Feng presented the checklist suggesting essential items to be reported on ecological niche models. A checklist like this is of great importance and provides guidelines on important information to allow reproducibility. So just to make a comparison, uh, checklists like this one uh, provide more focused recommendations at the domain level of the analysis, while our research and the framework I presented is more related to the other computational layers that are involved in this process. Of course, uh, there are intersections between them, uh, between these two um, approaches, and the combination of them uh, increases the chances of an experiment to be uh, reproducible. Including this presentation, uh, we basically saw that scientific workflow, workflow technologies can automate experiments and data analysis. It can also help in scalability in experiments especially on high computing uh, platforms, high computational platforms. And ensuring reproducibility is not a trivial task, of course, but um, reproducibility can support the validation of results, trends, and indicators uh, produced by experiments in biodiversity, for example. And these aspects can be understood and perceived as ways to provide a more effective contributions for the community. So that's it. Thank you very much.